Bibles this morning, make your way to the Gospel of Luke, the 12th chapter, please. We'll begin with verse 35 in a few moments. I don't know about you, but it seems to me like Thanksgiving should have already come. Uh, I guess it's late this year. I don't know who decided to make it late. It was not my fault, though. Don't blame me. But I feel like it should have happened this past week. And, um, and I'm probably not going to help you any if you already feel like the month has been long and we haven't had Thanksgiving yet because I'm not giving you a Thanksgiving message this morning. Not seven reasons to be thankful or seven ways to give thanks to God or so forth. Uh, however, I do think the message today will give you reason to uh, be thankful. And uh, hopefully uh, you will choose to reflect that in how you live your life after uh, this sermon as well. If nothing else, it's a short sermon, so you can be grateful and thankful for that. All right, uh, the Gospel of Luke, the writer of Luke begins obviously speaking of the birth and the childhood of Jesus Christ in chapters 1 and 2, and verse, excuse me, chapters 3 and 4. Uh, the writer speaks about the uh, inauguration uh, or the preparation of Jesus' ministry, uh, the temptations, uh, the genealogy, establishing who he is and so forth. Chapters 5, 6, and following, uh, or a summation, or a short version, excuse me, of the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 in more detail. And then Jesus continues on to teach different crowds as he travels from town to town. We've seen this in chapters 8, chapters 9, and chapters 11 as well. And so far in chapter 12, we have seen much of what he's taught as he has demonstrated not only his power uh, through healings and miracles, uh, but also declared uh, his authority. Uh, to be the Son of, of God, to, to be the Messiah, uh, to be uh, who He is. And uh, so He's taught and He's uh, demonstrated at the same time. Now, in this chapter, a few weeks ago when we looked at it, because if you were here last couple weeks, you know we took a break from this, and, and uh, we had an emphasis on Orphan Sunday and adoption and the power of seeing the gospel in, in adoption. Uh, but prior to that, in the earlier part of chapter 12, Jesus tells us in verse 15, is that man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. In other words, our life is not defined by our stuff. Our, 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 our stuff doesn't determine whether we are, have a good life or a, a bad life. He also said uh, in, the same, in this chapter, uh, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, or about your body, or what you will wear. Life is more than food, and your body is more than clothes. In other words, we're not meant to be worried about our needs. Um, particularly the needs that have no reference or carry on over into eternity. They're, they're short-lived. Uh, for, for this time on this earth, it doesn't mean we ignore our needs. Uh, I know you don't ignore your, all your needs. Uh, you wouldn't be breathing this morning if you ignored that particular need. So you have a desire to see that one met pretty regularly. Uh, but that's part of what Jesus is saying here. You don't have to worry about your breath. God is taking care of that for you. Now, you have your body to take care of, of course, but he, he will take care of our needs. He will meet our needs uh, even more so than he has for the birds and of the air, as we saw a few weeks ago. Uh, but sadly, today, we spend so much time, so much energy, and, and much of our resources on trying to acquire greed or try to protect or worried about our needs and, and just, just trying to meet what we think we, we want and what we think we need. And so as we've learned weeks past that our lives are not to be defined by our stuff or by our needs, if we're not to be greedy, if we're not to be worrisome, then how are we to be? How are we to live our lives? In this chapter, he's told us in verse 21, Jesus has told us, be rich towards God, which means we lavish our lives upon God. Uh, we, 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 we owe everything to him, so we recognize it's all all his to begin with, and we just lavish our entire life and how we live. We're rich towards him. Verse 31, he tells us to seek his kingdom above everything else. There is to be no one or anything else more important, more, more mindful of our, uh, as we think, we should not think of anything else more so than we do of, of God and his kingdom. And then verse 33, store treasure in heaven, which means we're to live our lives in such a way as to where we're investing in eternity, not spending here in the present, which will not have any impact upon uh, our eternity once it's spent. So uh, now we see, though, he, he's taking care of what we should not do, and now he addresses what we should do, and he gives us two commands uh, in, in this 
text that we're going to read here in just a few moments. And this is eschatological matters that we're talking about here. In other words, end times. Now, if I was to go out in the room and ask what you believe about the end times, we would quickly discover that we all do not agree upon the same things here. When we think about the end times, when we think about eschatological matters, we have differing differing, excuse me, opinions or beliefs. In other words, some of us would label ourselves pre-tribulationist. Others would call ourselves post-tribulationist. Some of us would call ourselves pre-millennial, while others would call us post-millennial or even non-millennial. Some of us anticipate a little anticipation of this earth, while others believe there'll be an entirely different earth that we will live on. Some anticipate a literal rebirth of Israel, while others think it to be more symbolic. And that's okay that we have these deferring opinions. We will know who's right and who's wrong and won't care anymore, by the way, when it actually happens. But there's one thing. There's one thing that every one of us in this room does agree on. If you are a Christ follower, if you, if you have confessed your sins and repented of them, if you had chosen to believe in Lord Jesus Christ, if you've accepted his life, his death, his resurrection, if you believe in what he's taught, what he said about himself, what scripture says of him, then we all together believe that there is a day coming when Jesus Christ will return and fully consummate his kingdom and rule in this world. Amen? Amen. If you don't believe that, or you don't know whether you believe that, then this message is is for you. (laughs) Because hopefully in the text that I'm about to read here, you'll see where you are in the storyline. But I also want you to know if you do believe that, that you believe in Jesus' return, this message is for you as well. And I hope you'll see yourself in this storyline. So as we think about these end times, are they important? Do we need to dwell on them? Well, we don't need to worry about them. We don't have to be anxious about them. Even Scripture tells us not to be anxious about things. But we do know they're important. In the New Testament, there are 260 chapters. And in those 260 chapters, Jesus' Jesus's return is mentioned at least 318 times. Which means, statistically, for every 25 verses, the Bible refers to the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So it is an important matter. But as we anticipate his return, as we follow Jesus, we are Christ's followers, yes, and we know one day we will be in heaven, but we're not in heaven yet. So the question we're asking ourselves, if we don't live lives that are greedy, and if we don't live lives that were worrisome, then how are we to live our lives? And he gives us two commands to answer that question. First is this, be ready. Look at verse 35. Verse 35, be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like men waiting for the master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. So first Jesus says to be ready. Verse 35 Be dressed ready, to be more specific. The King James Version says, let your loins be girded about. Now, the Greek word for girded means to fasten garments underneath the robe or or a belt. Excuse me, underneath a girdle or or a belt. And understand that in Jesus' day and still in some locations of the world today, uh, men wear long Um, flowing, uh, loosely fit uh, clothing. 
Uh, it's good for the, the hot weather they experience there for it to be loose. And the length of it is oftentimes because of modesty reasons. But when it comes to running or performing certain tasks that they have to do in their employment or even around the house uh, to better be able to do so, they will just take the bottom of their, their clothing and just kind of pull it up and kind of tuck it inside their, their belt or uh, a rope they have around uh, their waist. That gives them this ability to, to move about. So they're dressed ready, if you would say. They're, they're ready for what? For service or for whatever it is they needed to be ready for. But Jesus also says to keep your lamps burning. So it's not just be ready in the sense of, of an awareness, but also lamps burning, which means I'm kind of lighting it. I'm making a difference where I'm at. Here it's kind of hard for us to comprehend that because we don't, we don't like candles to light up our rooms or houses or our churches like they did years ago. Today we flip a switch or, crazily, even clap our hands and the lights just come on, you know? But this idea is that in Jesus' day, it required oil and, and the wicks had to be cared for. So there was this, this work, this in, involvement of making sure the candle was ready. The lamps were constantly burning because they didn't know when the master would return. And that's the question here we're asking ourselves. Well, what, what do we need to be ready for? What, what are we watching for? This, this sense of, of alertness. What are we anticipating? Well, it's, it's not like anticipating a family member coming home. Last night, our oldest son, Michael, and his wife, Daisy, arrived. We knew they were on their way. They told us days before they were coming. They left around noon. We knew they'd be here around 9, and that happened. We cleaned the house a little bit. We anticipated their, their arrival. We longed for it. We looked forward to it, and, and we were happy they've arrived. But it's, it's more than that. Because, see, when they arrived, they, they refreshed our lives. They brought joy into our hearts. Um, they help us to celebrate the upcoming holiday. And I could go on with a few more. But nothing changes as far as the world, and certainly not as far as the rule of of God's kingdom in this world, simply because they chose to come and visit us. So you see, as we wait for the Lord's return, and we're not told when that'll be, but we know it will happen as we anticipate, as we are ready for it, we know that when he arrives, he doesn't come as a family member or a good friend returning home. He comes to change things. And what a change it will be. You so say, how do you know this is what Jesus is referring to? Well, verse 40 is very clear about that. Verse 40, Jesus says, you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. So you see, in Jesus' day, when people left for weddings, oftentimes they were gone for days. And those who were left to care for the house didn't know when they'd return. They just knew they, they would anticipate the return. And so the idea that Jesus is speaking to us about today is that we are always to be ready. Jesus doesn't command us to get ready. He commands us to be ready. You see the difference there? We're not to be getting ready. We are to be ready, which means whatever we keep putting off, whatever we keep distancing from ourselves, whatever we're setting aside and say, I'll address that later, whatever we're thinking when I get older, whatever we think when I get healthier, when I get better, or when I get this problem resolved, then I'm going to do this. No, that's not ready. So it's not about getting ready. It's about being ready. It's a state of mind and an awareness that we are to maintain. And to help us understand that he speaks about this, he gives this parable that Master leaves for, for a wedding. Which to me is, is, is a great illustration of that. I have to mention to you what Warren Wearsby says in his commentary though. 
He speaks that perhaps this man might be the actually, actually the one getting married. He's left to a different town, a different village, where the wedding ceremony is to take place. The celebration lasts many, many days. Those who are left of the house have no idea when he's going to return, but they know when he's coming back. It's not just him coming, but he's bringing his bride with him. And certainly he would want everything to be ready. He would want everything to be the way it's supposed to be. Not just for his arrival, but also for the arrival of his bride. In both verse 37 and 38, Jesus tells us to be good. Excuse me, tells us that it would be good for those who are watching and ready. So it's good for us to be ready. Well, how good? Do not miss this. Verse 37, look at what Jesus says. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve. We'll have them reclined at the table and will come and wait on them. Do you see that incredible promise made to us in Scripture? The scene is that of servants who have remained at the home to keep things in good condition, who are constantly waiting for their master's return. What a lovely scene it is to to imagine as the master returns and those servants declare, Welcome home. We're so glad you're back. We're sure you're tired. Why don't you have a seat and let us wash your feet that you might refresh. These are this image of servants who know that their lives are not about themselves. Their lives are about their master. But then things suddenly change. They don't, they don't go the way the, the servants thought. They suggest the master sit down that they might care for his needs. But instead the master tells them to take a place of, of and be seated. And he begins to prepare a meal for them. He begins to serve and to, to wait on them. amazing to think of this image of of our Lord and Savior treating us in such fashion. For some of you in this room, you find it very difficult to to imagine that, to anticipate the, the reality behind that. Partly because perhaps the way you were taught by the reverence of God, His holiness, which is true, He's a very holy God and deserves our reverence. But sometimes we've We've image, pictured him as being distant and far off because he's holy and we're not. And we're thinking there's no way God could treat us this way. For others of you, though, it may be more personal. Maybe because something in your life today. Maybe a sense of you don't feel worthy. Well, join the rest of us. None of us are worthy of it. That's why it's called grace. But we, we struggle with the imagery, though, because we know it's grace. But we know there's something in our life today. That's it's not right, not right with God. And so we struggle with an image. I would just ask you just to pray about that and see if maybe God's speaking to you specifically about something in your life today. Scripture gives us good imagery of this. In the book of John, chapter 13, Jesus is observing a meal with his disciples. When he stands up, takes off his outer clothing, wraps a towel around his waist, and begins to wash their feet as a demonstration of service for them to see and also for us to see today as well how we are to serve others. And also in John chapter 21, the Bible tells us a time when Peter came onto the shore, and there was Jesus. He had cooked some fish, and he began to serve him and the disciples some food to eat. So what a beautiful Beautiful promise. And it was spoken of in the Old Testament. Isaiah 25, 6 says, On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all people, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. This is is incredible. We oftentimes refer to it as the the Great Supper. It's when Jesus returns, and he's going to host this grand banquet. For all of his followers, 
All of us will partake of that. All of us will enjoy this, this feast, this, this grand banquet. But sadly, there's, there's believers today, Christians, who are unmoved by the idea of Jesus returning and, and, and by this banquet as well. Just, there's a cold theological understanding. Instead of looking forward with anticipation, they're focused on their own life today, living for today, much like the rest of the world. But there are, and I pray many in this room, are a number of Christians who are anticipating the return of our Lord and Savior. Choosing to live for His glory and not their own. Seeking to give Him praise and adoration for all that He's done and for all that He will do. Living with hopeful anticipation of seeing Jesus face to face. So the command is to be ready. The first command is to to be ready, to be alert, to be watchful. But there's a second command in this text, beginning with verse 41, and that is to be faithful. Look at verse 41. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? Lord answered, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, My master is taking a long time in coming. And then begins to beat the men servants and maid servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. That servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given, much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So the second command is to be faithful. Peter is asking Jesus this question. He's wanting to know, hey, are you speaking to us only? Are you speaking this to everybody? Does this apply only to to us, your closest followers, or does it apply to others who are following you in the distance? Does it apply to only us who are following in some way, or does it apply to every person on earth? He's asking this question, and Jesus answers with this illustration of the faithful versus unfaithful servants. And what he's saying is that while we are waiting, we are to be ready. We are to be faithful in the work the Lord has given us to do. If you think about it, you really cannot call yourself a follower of Christ and not actually serve in the way he served. Because to follow him is to mimic him. It's to live like him. It's to be his reflection here on this earth. And so we are to not just be alert, watchful, ready. We are to be faithful. We are to be serving. We are to be about our Father's business. And if found to be good stewards in this life, then we'll be given even greater responsibility in heaven. What God has given you in this earth, and while you may compare it to others, you might say, I have less than others, or I have more than others. What God has blessed you with in this earth, you are to be good stewards of it, and to be faithful with it, investing it in His kingdom purposes. And if you're responsible with it, then He promises you an even greater responsibility in heaven. But don't miss the warning. For there's also the unfaithful servant that's mentioned, as well as the ignorant servant. You might say, what's the difference? Well, the ignorant service, the text said, will be punished, but his punishment will be light compared to the unfaithful servant. The idea being here is that the knowledge of God and his will is a trust, a stewardship. The more you know of God, the more you are required to do. 
And so, while there are some who are ignorant, and they still will face punishment, those who are unfaithful because they know what they should do, but they're not, it's a greater punishment waiting, according to Jesus' words here. So we see this idea of Jesus coming. We don't know when he's going to come. It could be during the first watch. It could be the second or the third watch. It's back in verse 38, I believe. Uh, keep in mind that's just different time segments. The second and the third being later in the night. The third being the darkest and before the dawn. You know, we hear the phrase, oftentimes parents tell our children, you know, nothing good ever happens after midnight. It's the idea that our Lord and Savior may come back at any time. Things can be very dark. And we see the history of darkness oftentimes being repeated throughout mankind's living on this earth. And we would look at the day and age we're in today. We would look at how so much of our world is turning away from God. We see a lot of darkness. But there's also a lot of light. God's doing some great things all over the world. The point is, is we don't know. We, we can look... And Tell the times you can get an idea. There's a, there's a storm coming. It's going to rain tonight or tomorrow. We have no idea when Jesus is going to return. So it's foolishness on our part to live our lives how we want to live in anticipation of fixing, cleaning up, or getting right later before Jesus returns when we don't know there will be a later. Meaning if he comes today, Think about it, if you came while, right now while we're in this service. We, we don't know. So what does it mean to be faithful? Well, I simply want to remind you of the great commandment and the great commission. The great commandment says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The Great Commission says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In summary, love God, love one another, love others. Love God more than anyone or anything else. Love one another. The Bible is filled with one another's. We are to love one another, serve one another, respect one another, value one another, forgive one another. We're also to love others. See the passion Jesus Christ has for you and realize his compassion extends to those in the, in the world as well. That he longs for them to come into his kingdom and be a part of his family as well. How have you been living your life today. If Jesus was to return at this moment, would you say you're ready? I'm not saying you're perfect. You need to be perfect. Jesus didn't say that here. But are you ready? Are you anticipating and are you serving him with what he has given you to serve him with? Years ago, Queen Victoria of England told one of her chaplains after chapel service, that she longed for the Lord to return during her lifetime. The chaplain asked her why he wanted the Lord to return during her lifetime. She said, it's so that I could lay my crown at his blessed feet in reverent adoration for who he is. That's the image of being ready. God has given us things, a life and resources. And the idea is to be ready such that when Jesus returns, we are already ready to be able to lay it down at his feet. To return what he's entrusted us and say, here, this is what I've done with all that you've given to me. And that he will respond to us in identifying us as good servants. Titus chapter 2 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no 
to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. As our worship team comes up, I ask you, are you ready for the Lord's return? The only way you could possibly be ready at all is to be saved. And the only way to be saved is through faith in Jesus Christ. If you've not already done so, we ask you today, would you choose to believe in Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection? Would you choose to turn your life to him, to surrender your life, to acknowledge your need of him to forgive you of your sins, that he would be your hope for eternal life to come? Are you ready for the Lord's return? For those of you who have made such a decision, who are truly Christian, how's your relationship with him? It's not about him coming right now while you're sitting in church and like, oh, this is good, man. I'm in church. He'll be happy with me. I've been singing songs. We prayed. I listened to this sermon. It's not about what you're doing at the very moment. It can't be about our alertness, meaning sense and awake, or else we can't go to sleep at night for fear to come back. It's not an awakeness, sleep, not sleep. It's an awareness and an alertness. It's an anticipation. It's such that it drives the way we live our lives. That we don't want to waste one single moment in this life when we know there's a way to invest it for his kingdom. And we don't want to miss one single opportunity to share the love of Jesus with others who do not know him. Because at any moment, at any moment, he returns. And when he does, everything changes. So if you're sitting here this morning and there's something in your life and you've been anticipating fixing it later, if you've been thinking, I'm going to deal with that later, this relationship, I, I know it's not right, but I'll, I'll resolve it later. The choices you're making, the, the lifestyle, the, um, the actions, you know what they are. And if there's such that they're not honoring to the Lord, they speak against what his word speaks of, and you, are, you know you're not right with him, then you are not ready. And we invite you this morning, whether it's by coming to the altar alone or, or coming with someone or, or just coming up to one of us, and we might pray with you. This is an opportunity for you to be ready. Because our Lord's going to return. He's coming back. And when he comes back, everything that he established when he first came, in his first appearing at his birth, he brings to completion in his second coming. Pray with me. Father, as we have this time of response this morning, pray you find our hearts desiring to be ready with you not holding anything back not pretending or I pray your spirit speaks to each and every individual heart accordingly move our our lives, our hearts, Father, in such a way as to where we won't merely just be thankful for the things we have, the family we get to enjoy this week with, and the opportunity to observe a holiday, but to be thankful for a God of second chances, for a God who redeems, for a God who restores, for a God who forgives. Refresh our hearts, Father, our lives. 
May we, may we see ourselves this morning bowing at your feet to worship you and to offer you our very lives this day because you are worthy of our praise. And may it be for your glory and for your honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand this morning as we sing? We invite you to respond. The altar is open. We're here to pray with you as well.